So our first talk this morning is traveling plants, creating a volunteer driven TEI XML project model for making archives accessible during a world pandemic. Today, we'd like to share with you our traveling plants project, which is a collaboration between the Royal Botanic Gardens Q, the University of Roehampton and the University of the Third Age. My name's Kate Telcher and I'm Emeritus Fellow of the University of Roehampton and an Honorary Research Associate at the Royal Botanic Gardens Q. So today we'd like first to give an outline of the project uh, and then Kiri Ross Jones, who's the senior archivist at Royal Botanic Gardens Q, will talk about its organization and management. Uh, and then Dustin Frazier Wood from the University of Roehampton will talk about the text encoding initiative or TEI element. And finally, Kiri will discuss how our, our project might be a model for the sector and also um, end with some comments from our volunteers. We're um, about halfway through our 12 month National Archives testbed funded project. Travelling Plants aims to transcribe, research and encode the Q record book, which is the first volume in the Goods Inwards and Outwards registers, which is a series of 155 volumes that record the incoming and outgoing plants at Kew. We wanted to create a project that uses freely available materials, that draws on standard encoding methods developed in the digital humanities, and that could be used as a model for the sector. We're now at the midpoint in our project, and we want to report on some of the approaches and materials that we've adopted to keep the volunteers engaged in the challenging work of transcription and introduce them to new encoding skills remotely. We've created a website, and this is an image of our homepage, and designed a staged project with, with clear protocols. Throughout, we sought to enthuse and also reassure our U3A volunteers and create a supportive network of small groups, which encourages the volunteers to work together and importantly, to ask, answer each other's questions. The Travelling Plants project grew out of an existing relationship between RBGQ and the University of Roehampton. Some years ago, I started research in the archives for a cultural history of Kew's Palm House. And the association between the two institutions developed further over the years when we've been jointly supervising a collaborative doctoral award. Together, Kiri, Dustin and I identified a research project that would meet two of RBGQ's aims, extend the reach of Q's collections through digitization and address its colonial past. Kiri informed us of the existence of a complete set of page scans of the Q record book, which is a historically significant manuscript volume in the archives. Running to some 400 pages, this folio size volume details Q's incoming and outgoing plants from years 1793 to 1809. Uh, was the period when the gardens came under the informal directorship of the naturalist Sir Joseph Banks. Unlike later um, volumes in the series, the Q record book contains copies of letters from plant collectors overseas. As a record of transactions between colonial botanic gardens and major trading bodies, such as the East India Company, the volume is a key text in the colonial history of Kew. It details the transfer of plants across the world and traces the global origins of plants now naturalized in the horticultural landscape of Britain. For instance, here you can see one of the early entries 
which is the list of plants brought home in His Majesty's ships Providence by Captain I in the year 1893. And it itemizes plants which are headed by the breadfruit uh, from Tahiti, New Guinea, St. Helena, St. Vincent and Jamaica. Now, by transcribing and digitizing this volume and making it freely available on the Biodiversity Heritage website, um, we hope to contribute to Q's ongoing commitment to decolonize its collections. And to engage volunteers and, communi and communicate the importance of digitization, I gave a couple of talks on the historical significance of the volume, addressing Q's colonial past, and pointing to possible ways that the project might open up future avenues of research. As you can see from these page scans, the entries in the Q record book are in a variety of hands of varying degrees of decipherability. Most entries consist of lists of plant names in botanical Latin, and some are annotated with a variety of symbols of uncertain meaning. Now, the Latin names pose uh, particular challenges um, since volunteer transcribers are unlikely to recognize them and the spelling is often inconsistent. And in addition, current plant names have changed from those in use in the 18th century. Traveling Plants was a project born in lockdown. We wanted to create a remote project to counter the effects of pandemic related social isolation and develop the digital capacity of older people who were of course amongst those at highest risk from COVID-19. My colleague Dustin, who when not lecturing at the University of Roehampton looks after the library at the Spalding Gentlemen's Society, has experience of leading a digitization project with the University of the Third Age in the East Midlands. And Roehampton University's School of Humanities also has links with the London U3A. So building on these connections, we proposed a shared learning project to the London U3A. And the involvement of the London U3A in publicizing and recruiting volunteers volunteers for the project has been critical to the project's success. Now I'm going to hand over to Kiri, who'll talk about the management and organisation of the project. Hi, thanks Kate. Hi everyone, I'm Kiri, Senior Archivist at Kew. Um, so we decided to split the project into three distinct stages for the volunteers, um, which started after we had recruited them and trained them up. Phase one, which we started in March, involves doing a straight transcription of the volume using our uh, protocols to do that, and also researching the people, place and ship names to create full endnotes that will then be encoded in the second phase of the project. So phase two, which we're just about to move on to, involves uh, TEI XML coding the transcriptions that have been created, and Dustin is going to tell you a little bit more about that phase. Phase three will involve researching and indexing the plant names that appear in the volume. We decided to separate this out because um, it, it's a very complex thing to have to do, um, so we didn't want to overwhelm the volunteers. We will then publish the images, TI and transcriptions in the Biodiversity Heritage Library and also in our own archive catalogue, um, which is CALM. And then finally, we will have a project celebration at Kew, hopefully, um, social kind of distance restrictions allowing and actually get to meet some of our volunteers face to face, which we hope will be a nice end to the project. This phased approach seems to have worked well with no one becoming overwhelmed um, and has allowed the volunteers to fully immerse themselves in this volume and the transcription or transcribing um, and to fully understand the volume and also become expert in the handwriting within it. All the technology that we've used has been free or open source used a WordPress site um, for the website. Uh, we've used platforms such as Zoom and Padlet and TEI itself is also open source. Project images have been shared and work tracked via my own OneDrive, um, which volunteers can access through shared links. But you could also use something like Google Drive. So um, we have um, 
done um, various training sessions to get our volunteers started. Um, and at the very start of the project, we created some very detailed transcription protocols, um, a project working methodology document that we shared with the volunteers, and also some example transcription. We had a launch, a Zoom launch for our volunteers in which we introduced the project and methodology. And then after they had had um, a couple of weeks to kind of spend transcribing the documents, um, we ran a drop-in Zoom session where we could answer any queries they had about transcription. Um, this was quite challenging, <laughs> trying to answer these kind of things off the top of our head, but um, it went well and also gave us a chance to kind of develop our protocols in partnership with the volunteers and create guidance that was really useful for them. We've also had another Zoom session in response to volunteer feedback where we had experts such as Kate talk about uh, the research use of the volume and we also had someone talking about plant names. As Kate mentioned, we split our volunteers into small working groups to do the transcriptions. Um, their groups were about three to four. The volunteers didn't really know each other already. Um, and we tried to mix up the skills that they brought to the project. Um, for example, we mixed up people who had techie skills with people with historical skills, people with horticultural knowledge. Um, this group working, I think, has been really successful and made the project very self-supporting, which has been really important to me over the last year. Um, with most of my team at Q on furlough and also trying to kind of fit in homeschooling on and off as well. Um, but we also wanted to create a self-supporting project um, model for the archive sector, as we know that, you know, we're not a particularly generously resourced sector. It's up to the volunteers how they work in their groups, but we have said that um, volunteers have to get another volunteer within their group to check their transcription as something we, as the project team, don't have capacity to do. We asked the volunteers to set up um, a forum in which they could kind of ask each other queries and they chose Padlet. And we've got here um, a slide of that Padlet discussion. This is quite a nice example. Um, volunteer A writes there, um, this is a close up of the word I can't identify um, in the image above there. Volunteer B writes chiefly. Volunteer A writes, thanks. It's so obvious now. Why did I think it was a fly? That's quite, quite a nice example of the use of Padlet. And I understand that um, the volunteer groups have also set up WhatsApp groups for their groups. Um, so they can also check similar queries this way and also to, I think, socialize, get to know each other. Um, what we think has worked well um, is this kind of group working and self-supporting model. And we've had huge levels of engagement from the volunteers. And also, I think a very high volunteer retention during the project, we haven't really lost any of them. Do you have some lessons learned though? Um, that would be to try to get your protocols as comprehensive as possible before starting, but be mindful that there should be some input from your volunteers and they will change. Um, try to manage expectations around the time support you can give to the volunteers. For example, how quickly you might be able to respond to an email. Think about how you might manage volunteers joining the project once it started, we found this quite difficult. Um, and also think about the technology you're using. For example, if you're not familiar with it, um, something like the OneDrive and OneDrive links can be quite challenging. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Dustin now. Thanks, Kiri. Um, so as Kiri and Kate have mentioned, the second phase of traveling plants get volunteers to encode the transcriptions that they've completed into a machine-readable digital edition. Um, and this slide and the next will put that in visual terms. But so here we have the first stage of the transcription phase, where we have the manuscript leaf on the left, which becomes a transcription according to our protocols on the right. In the next image, however, um, we take the manuscript leaf and its transcription and we transform it into the kind of text that you see on the right of this slide, which is the same transcript encoded using TEI XML. Um, and it looks a bit intimidating at first, um, but once you get your eyes around the angle brackets and color changes, it becomes a lot less challenging. And I'll show you maybe how that works in a few minutes. But first I want to try and answer two questions. Why encode these transcripts and why use TEI to do it? So the two big concerns with any digital project, um, which many of you will be familiar with, are longevity and obsolescence. PDFs are notoriously difficult to edit, 
and Word files are notoriously easily corrupted. Um, but because XML files are a building block of the internet and all its parts, there's no real unforeseen obsolescence or foreseen obsolescence. Um, and almost any device can display XML files. XML also lets us add hyperlinks, embed media, uh, create mouse over text, and add all sorts of metadata to our transcript. For unlocking manuscripts, that's incredibly important. Um, and by creating an edition of the record book that's immediately and automatically networked through all of these links and all of this metadata, we start to reintegrate the manuscript into its national and international contexts um, in a way that not only brings it to life, but also makes it useful for people who have questions that we ourselves can't anticipate right now. The form of XML that we're using follows the standards set by the Text Encoding Initiative, or TEI, which is an international network that maintains a standard for XML encoding that works across languages, operating systems, and platforms. TEI is very well supported and it is entirely dedicated to open access. So all of the tools and training materials we need to start with are freely available online. For our process, we're, or I'm working to tailor uh, some of those TEI training materials uh, around our project. And the great thing about TEI is that anybody can tailor the guidance for to make it as specific or as general as they need it to be. We decided to make the transcription, the, the encoding phase discrete from the transcription phase, primarily because the manuscripts are quite complex and TEI we thought would just be too much at the start of the project. You could transcribe straight into TEI XML, uh, depending on the nature of your material. So my main role is creating four types of training material, as I said, um, and I'm assuming in all of these that our volunteers have no knowledge or experience of TEI or XML encoding. The training has the four main components that you can see here, detailed written instructions, uh, a series of 10 to 15 minute YouTube videos that take volunteers step by step through using TEI, working with examples from the record, uh, from the record book, a set of finished encoded pages, the, the trickier ones to give volunteers guidance and visual cues when maybe we're not easily accessible, um, and finally, a series of Zoom Q&A sessions to answer their questions. And because Traveling Plants is a testbed project, we'll be reviewing the training materials all the way through, gathering feedback, um, revising them, hopefully improving them, and then making them available for any other collection to use um, just by visiting our website. So what's most important, I think, in all of the training, and uh, for me as the I guess the TEI person on this project, um, is taking the fear out of encoding. And I found actually that archivists and archive volunteers tend to find TEI XML pretty straightforward because it's essentially just structured metadata, both about the text as an object and about the content of the text. Um, to give you a taste of what I mean, here's the start of that long extract you saw a few slides ago. If you look closely at the structural markers right at the top, uh, you see what we call elements jump out. The first one is a div or division of our manuscript, and that's called a folio. The folio starts with a head or heading, number 157. So we're identifying uh, our structural components. Down toward the bottom, we've linked a place name. Uh, we've linked place names to geographic coordinates that translate to pins on Google Maps. When we get to the reference to the gardens at Calcutta, three lines up from the bottom, we have a ref or reference that links those words to the web page of the modern botanic garden in Kolkata. So linking the text out. And what's great is that all these standard elements in angle brackets, uh, like headers, make the encoded text both machine readable and machine queryable. So now we've encoded the record book, anyone could almost instantly generate a list of all the people, all the ships, or all the plants it contains. It could, we could generate a list of every instance of a particular plant name. We could even begin to query where particular plant names show up near particular geographic locations and start really building up maps and, and really understanding this text. Um, 
So although TEI XML can be intimidating at first, it is a lot like manuscript in that it's just natural language arranged in a slightly unfamiliar way. Um, and that basis in common language makes it fairly easy for volunteers to pick up and easy to work through and build on in bite-sized chunks. Once you work out the conventions, it actually becomes pretty straightforward. And in previous projects, volunteers have said they actually quite enjoy it. It becomes almost a game. Basically, it asks us to think about our texts in structural, orderly, and hierarchical ways and to organize the information we have about them. For traveling plants in particular, and for archive projects more generally, that gives us the potential to make our collections more accessible and interactive while also building the capacity, not only of ourselves, but also of our volunteers. I'm gonna hand back over to Kiri to share what our volunteers have said. Thanks, Dustin. Kind of looking to the future a little bit, we're hoping that uh, this project, project and methodology will feed into a larger H HRC project, which we've just applied for funding. Uh, this will include further work on the rest of this series of 155 volumes. And we'll look at the networks in them, the origins of plants and develop new inclusive frameworks to reinterpret historic green spaces. So um, that's all very exciting. Um, beyond that though, we, we've made the information in this volume much more accessible the first time in its 220 years of life. We can actually search this volume by plant name now, thanks to our volunteers work. We also have developed a methodology we can use to um, transcribe and make accessible the rest of the volumes in the series. And also we're very much hoping that we've created a model for the sector that can just be picked up and reused. We still have work to do. Um, for example, we need to find somewhere to host and read the TEI, TEI files. Um, so, you know, we still do have stuff to do. From my perspective, one of the most rewarding aspects has been working with the volunteers and how successful this has been. We did survey the volunteers to ask them um, for what they found the most challenging with regards to the project and what they enjoyed the most. Um, amongst the challenges, um, and you can see some of these challenges and things they enjoy on the um, word cloud here, the challenges, um, almost all of the respondents said deciphering the handwriting, um, which is very understandable, and also Latin plant names. One wrote, my biggest challenge is not spending too long at my screen. It is truly addictive. Um, so we've created a, a new generation of screen addicts. What they enjoyed, um, their answers uh, were mostly focused around working in the small groups, the kind of social side, um, researching the names they found in the volumes, and also interestingly, deciphering the handwriting. We also had comments about making previously unavailable history accessible worldwide and developing their understanding of this period of Britain's colonial history, which shows the success of the historical element of this project. Um, a few final volunteer comments I'd like to read to you. Um, one volunteer commented, it was a gift in lockdown to have something else to focus on other than the virus, masks and social distancing. Um, you know, this is great. This is one of the aims of our project. And finally, a final comment was, best of all, I've enjoyed being part of Kew Gardens. It is such a special place and has been part of my life for over 50 years. I'm so glad to be able to give something back in return. Um, but it's, you know, it's just lovely to hear, um, you know, our, our volunteers are all great. Um, okay, so finally, um, just thank you for listening. Um, here are all our contact details. If you want to talk about it, get in touch. We'd like to have some of our protocols or training materials. Please do get in touch with us all. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that talk. And just a reminder that Q and A button at the bottom of Zoom, if you would like to ask some questions. I'll start, I'll start with a question. Uh, what, what challenges have you found in setting up and running a project remotely? Um, sorry, I take that one. <laughs> um, the three of us haven't met in person for over the last, um, in, you know, 18 months, I think it's been really. Um, so, you know, everything's had to be conducted via Zoom. Um, or teams, you know, and, and that has challenges. I think with regard to the project and the volunteers, it's more about um, engagement. You know, how do we engage with these volunteers who've never met us? Um, they're not able to come to queue to the organisation for which they're going to be working. Um, they can't see our collections. Um, 
you know, and it's kind of finding ways around that of, of keeping them engaged um, and also you know, understanding the volume that they're working on. You know, to them, it's just a bunch of pages, you know, images of pages kind of on, or someone on the computer. <laughs> you know, how, how do we get across to them what this these pages are from and what the volume is? Um, and I think, you know, everything mentioned in the talk, kind of the um, talks that Kate has done kind of about the significance of the volume, we've shown them lots of images of it. Um, you know, we've spoken a bit about key history um, and all of that kind of stuff we've used to try and kind of overcome these issues of engagement. And, I, you know, I think um, it's worked quite well so far. I don't know if Kate Thank or you. Dustin want to add anything. I think um, we, we did think quite hard about engaging and enthusing and um, supporting and um, as Kiri said in the presentation that the small group work has been, I think, great at, at the volunteers supporting each other uh, and forming little friendship groups and sustaining each other. And, and, and they've really, you know, enjoyed this activity. And, you know, that's great. Perhaps nothing greater and better to hear in the feedback. Well, thank you very much for your response. We, we have a question from the audience. Um, what, what was the input from U3A apart from volunteers? Dustin, do you want to take that? Yeah, I was going to say, uh, which of us will we'll start with this? Um, I think there are a couple of things that they're giving us back, particularly because this is a sort of a test bed project we're actually asking them to refine the project protocols along with us. Um, and when we were just on the cusp of beginning the, the encoding phase, and we'll be asking them actually to pilot the protocols that we put in place for that. So it's a, it's a very discursive process and they're giving us back a lot of information. And they're also, uh, sorry, a lot of information about the process. I think they're also giving us um, insights into how these how this resource might be used by researchers because they're flagging up questions they're beginning the research themselves and they're starting to draw our attention to things that i certainly was unlikely to have noticed on my own um, so yeah thinking forward we're, we're actually benefiting a lot from having those 30 plus pairs of eyes and minds working thank you and another question that's come in, how many volunteers were involved? Any issues with dropping out or difficulty with skill development? Uh, um, yeah, I can answer that one. Um, we've currently got 32 volunteers. Um, at, at the very start, we had one or two more who quickly realised it wasn't the project for them and did drop out. But um, we've actually had, I think, really high volunteer retention compared to other volunteer projects I've managed with that core group of 32, um, you know, being involved from the very start. Um, yeah, so, you know, that, that side has gone really well. Um, you know, we have, um, we have done um, quite a lot of training with them and developed quite a few protocols to help them, um, both with the, you know, the difficult task of transcribing the volume, but also, you know, working, how to work in groups um, and a little bit kind of on using just basic, things around the technology, kind of how to use OneDrive links, that kind of thing. Um, and obviously Dustin's gonna um, provide a lot more support around the encoding part of the project, um, which, you know, I'll be learning along with the volunteers. So that, you know, that'll be really, um, really nice to do. We may be, um, the uh, retention levels uh, might be due to the fact that, that you know, for much of this time, there wasn't much else going on. <laughs> so, um, I mean, and, and you know that's that's worth bearing in mind. But you know that's how we also think of this as an important project. That this was giving people, you know, a, a worthwhile activity to be uh, engaged on. And I think we did want to stress how important and worthwhile it it, it is. Um, and I think you know perhaps the kind of historical significance of the volume helps that. You know, this is a unique and you know interesting. Uh, text and that sense that they were engaged on something important was also helpful. Yeah, yeah it will be um, it'll be interesting to see when we come on to the encoding phase if any do start dropping out then because that's quite different to dealing with the 
historic handwriting. Um, but we, with the group working, we tried to mix up the skills within the group. So we've got people, um, you know, we've got former kind of software developers and programmers um, who are amongst the volunteers. So we tried to scatter those by, you know, really strong IT skills throughout the groups, as well as people with historical expertise and those with botanical knowledge. And we're hoping that um, they will be able to support each other within the group with this aspect of the work and hopefully keep them engaged. Thank you. Just a quick uh, question, I think, for Dustin. I was just curious, like, how, how many XML files did you kind of end up generating in the end and what are you doing with them all? This is this is the great question. Uh, so we're working because the, the structure of, of the project asked the volunteers to work page by page. So what I'm doing is creating all of the header and kind of background information for that for one master XML file, they're working in page templates that I've designed. And then as those come in, they're checked and just kind of carried over into one master file for the one master XML file. Um, and we're still exploring where it lives at the minute. This is, this is always the big question. Um, we've got a couple of options, including a, a possibility that we'll, we'll actually publish it using a, using one of the publishers, but um, that's TBD. Great. Well, th thanks very much for your talk. And um, we're going to move now on to our second talk today. So that talk is entitled Starting with Solutions, How We Made Our Collection Systems and Assets Work Harder. Um, OK, uh, hopefully everyone can see the slides. Uh, just get the te technology working. So I'm, I'm Guy Baxter. Um, I'm Head of Archive Services at the University of Reading. I'm joined today by my colleague uh, Jo Vaughan, who's the digital editor. Um, and although she can't be here today, um, we're grateful to Sharon Maxwell, who supported us certainly with the work and, and with the preparation for this. Um, and we're from the University's Museums and Special Collections Services, which includes the special collections of rare books and archives, and the art collections, and also the Museum of English Rural Life. So uh, some of you may have been at DCDC 19 and heard us talk about, uh, particularly about our social media engagement with the Museum of English Rural Life. And you'll be thinking, well, these guys must be absolutely great at digital access. Um, and, you know, we, in, in many ways, we are very good at that. We, um, you know, we have 100, nearly 160,000 followers on Twitter, 12,000 on Instagram. We must be doing something right. Um, and for those of you who, who don't know what that's all about, um, then you, you may, um, you, I encourage you to, to follow us on Twitter and have a, ha, have a look at the, uh, the impact that this particular, this particular large RAM had. Um, it went viral. We've had several other tweets since then went viral and, um, and uh, have established ourselves as, as, um, uh, as uh, I think, amusing and also hopefully informative uh, presence uh, on Twitter about, uh, about, about rural life and the countryside and its heritage. But actually, um, if you look back to the start of 2020, we, we were struggling to make content uh, accessible online despite that, that social media reach, despite having a really large pool of digitized content um and uh, a really enthusiastic team and we've got 100 nearly 170,000 uh, digital assets on our, on our system so you you'd wonder why we'd be, be struggling with that but actually a, a lot of that was was down to something that that Kiri actually referred to in that in that previous uh, fabulous previous talk when she said uh, that that our sector tends to be somewhat under resourced I think she said it's somewhat under resourced in terms of of, of this kind of thing and uh, that's certainly certainly always true for us so when COVID, when COVID struck, we knew we had a, a problem about providing digital access, but we also knew that we had some of the solution. We had some of the building blocks that, to, to create a, a solution and quite quickly. And I think we probably also realised that in building that solution for the immediate crisis, we'd probably solve some of the long term issues as well. Um, but I wanted to say a little bit about um, give you a little bit of context in terms of, of, of how digital access works for us, so a little bit about us. So the Museum of English Rural Life is the University's Red, 
of Reading's largest and most high profile museum. Um, and much of our digital engagement does center around, around the museum um, and at that level. But as I said, our department does manage other collections as well. Uh, rare books, archives and, and artworks on other subjects. So we have quite a few channels, quite a few different sort of brands, I suppose. Um, what's our digital activity do? It supports not just public engagement, but also research, university teaching and learning. Um, and the reason I chose this image is because I wanted to say that, that also a lot of the work and, and, and when, I, when I hand over to Joe in, in, in a bit, he may, he may mention some of this, uh, because it particularly relates to his work, it's in the context of Museums Partnership Reading, which is us working with Reading Museum and the, the local authority run museum as well. So most, I think most museums, libraries and archives, and especially those which have a strong research focus, will recognise that there's a disconnect between access to collections information that's for researchers and access to digital content for a wider audience. And, and strategies that try and bridge that divide come up against this kind of fundamental problem, which is you've got all these distinct audiences, perhaps with their own preferences. But we can't, uh, particularly smaller institutions, but even larger institutions can't maintain separate platforms for all of them. Um, so I suppose we might think of this as, as a spectrum of access. At one end, we've op you've optimised it for the audience. And at the other end, it's optimised for the collections system, the efficient and effective operation of a, of a collections information system. So audience optimised access, meeting people where they are, um, that's likely to be more labour intensive. That involves writing blogs, using social, curating online exhibitions, loading content into gateways and aggregators, that kind of work. At the other end, perhaps it's, uh, it's, it, it's simpler in that you, perhaps we're just putting digital content and attaching it into our catalogue. Um, and, and that's great if, for people who already know about the content, want lots of it, they can find the catalogue, they know how to use the catalogue. Um, but but not so good for people who perhaps don't have uh, who who don't have those skills or those approaches or the, or that sort of background. Um, like most institutions, we'd like to do both uh, to reach multiple platforms from a single source of truth. Um, but we're aware that new audience possibilities and new access platforms are appearing all the time. Um, whereas in most museums, library, and archive institutions. The underlying systems development is working on a very different time scale and probably with a pretty limited budget. And sometimes it's different people who are responsible for different things as well. So this is fraught with um, with with danger. I mean, if we if we develop or adapt our systems for multiple audiences, there's a danger we'll end up not meeting anyone's needs. So the, the kind of one size fits all approach, but we find that one size actually doesn't fit all. Um, and then, of course, there's also a, a, a danger that you end up with shadow IT systems building up where people just are doing their own thing and it becomes un, un, unregulated and kind of patchy and hard to manage. So how do we get a handle on this? Well, our approach was to is based around three kind of key decisions that we made. First is to have a digital working group that covers all aspects of what we do digitally with senior management participation. And the second, I think, is to, is to take an approach which makes our existing systems work quite hard and only to add sort of new developments where that's absolutely necessary. Uh, and thirdly, we tried to think about our audiences a lot and in the, in the widest sense. And I think this is best exemplified um, by a, a conceptual diagram that I did um, quite a while ago, uh, I think it was in 2018, for a presentation to a university-wide group. Um, and we were looking at, at, at digital technologies more generally. And I wanted to say what we were doing, and to some extent planning to do, because some of this was theoretical, on digital asset management. So at the centre, you'll see that there's a, there's a digital asset management system that we have. And I've, I've mentioned before that has you know, tens of thousands of assets within it. And, it. and if you look at the circle at the top, it, it actually does link to our, at least the ad lib part of our collections information, our cataloguing system. Um, and then we were looking at what are the other possibilities? What else do we need to use these assets for? And how, how do those link up? So for instance, how do, we, how do we use assets within the website? How do we use them in e-commerce? How do we give users direct access to them, whether that's online or whether that's, uh, wh whether that's when they're on site? Um, how, how do we manage the preservation and storage of those assets as well? 
So this in some ways it has, has become, although it was a, it was a model for thinking, it, it, it sort of became a, a model for action because of, of what happened in 2020. And we ended up really taking actions against every aspect of, of our digital asset management and, and the things that surround it as the kind of audience needs and the audience expectations shifted, um, as we may all recall, very rapidly. So one of the first things we did was we gave direct uh, off-campus access for staff. So we, we were only able to access the system uh, when we were on, on campus before, um, before the pandemic and, and that was rapidly changed. And I think, but I think the most important thing we did was to identify that there was an urgent need for a better public interface onto all of this. Um, to enable users to uh, access and to explore digitized content. And in particular, we were very keen to have the reassurance of a registration process before users could access high resolution versions. And one of the reasons for wanting that was because we wanted to open up the possibility of third party rights holders enabling content to go onto that platform, knowing that it wouldn't just spread and be downloaded um, absolutely everywhere. So, and, and actually to some extent that, that worked. Um, and, and we were able to manage that access process quite, quite well so we can limit it to, for instance, particular uh, teaching sessions where people need the high resolution content. Our existing systems just couldn't deliver what we needed. Um, we did manage to enhance our, our OPAC um, quite quickly to enable that to show multiple images, and that was that was good to be able to do. Um, but uh, in the end, we we knew we needed a different solution, and what that moved us towards was something that we called the virtual reading room, which I'm going to talk about a bit more in a minute. Um, and the solution we used for that was uh, Apexio by Metadatis, which was the, the, the basis for this kind of front end on our digital assets to enable uh, public access. But before I do that, I want to just hand, um, hand across to, to Joe to talk about some of the other things that were going on in terms of our, our digital uh, engagement and our kind of response to, to COVID. Hi, everyone. Yeah, thank you very much, Jai. And also thank you to um, <clears throat> uh, the, the brilliant talk from Q just now. Well. That was amazing. Um, yeah, so um, I think really I want to pick up on uh, just two things. One um, was the the amazing comment um, I think from one of the volunteers at Q about you know how how people were um, you know as as kind of all parts of um, you know recreation and society closed down. People really were looking for things to do um, beyond beyond the virus and then beyond masks. Um, and also uh, Guy's point about our emphasis on you know meeting people where they are. Um, and I think uh, a major part of our thinking straight away in the pandemic was um, thinking about where people aren't, and that was in museums. Um, you know, everything closed down so suddenly, um, and straight away, I think we recognised that there was um, more than an opportunity. I think kind of a real um, a real need for uh, museum uh, libraries and archives to kind of um, use the digital platforms available to them to to bring people. Um, collections and, and try and you know keep people at home entertained and, and informed and uh, you know all of the brilliant experiences that people can have in museums to transmit those into online um, you know uh, campaigns and, and content. Um, so yeah, very quickly, um, thanks to the um, the digital asset management system that guys referred to, um, we were able to carry on with um, sharing collection images um, from from home. Um, and the image on the right just there is a, 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 a mock-up uh, Zoom meeting featuring lots of the um, fabulous sheep in our collection, um, which did very well very quickly. Um, and I think, uh, I mean, that was the 23rd of March. Um, I'm not, I, can't, I can't quite remember the date that we closed, but it was very, that was very soon after, after that date. Um, and then two days later, um, we had, um, I think, one of our most viral posts on Twitter um, of the last year, which was... Um, which was an experiment with the with the then extremely popular video game Animal Crossing, um, where we basically, um, I think it might have been the morning or the day after the game came out, um, we, re we recognized that there was a feature in game where people could create their own um, dresses and clothing. Um, and so what we did is we uh, invited uh, our Twitter audience, um, and in, in fact, all web users who saw the posts to go onto our online collections, view our, um, incredible photographs of uh, heritage smocks and then try and recreate them in the game. Um, and the post immediately um, 
kind of went viral. It got picked up by um, museum press, but also a incredibly video game press. I did an interview with Polygon magazine, which I'd never quite expected I'd do in this role. Um, but I think straight away it was um, what was so remarkable for me about about this about the campaign and the. Um, I don't think we have a picture in these slides, but just the the extent of the um, the engagement with it, which we've got in an online exhibition on our website, was um, the way in which people were able to participate in the in the life of the museum. You know, despite the doors being closed, everyone being stuck in their homes, um, it really um, cemented uh, for us so quickly that you know the the opportunity of digital digital media during this period of of closure, which back then we had no idea would last. Um, possibly, you know, 15 months or more, um, the, the sense that digital media really could help us bring the museum into people's homes. Um, and we've been experimenting that with that uh, ever since really in lots of different ways. Um, Guy, if you'd go on to the next slide, please. Yeah, and um, together with, um, you know, being uh, basically a, a hub for all of our digital engagement and, um, I suppose also just to clarify that, so I'm the digital editor, which means um, I kind of produce and manage all of our web content, but also um, all of our social media content. Um, and because all of our engagement became digital engagement, um, it has been a year of wearing lots of hats, um, but it's been a, a good year and I'm, I'm very uh, proud of what we've accomplished. Um, but one other thing that we've been able to do um, using the online audience we've created is um, really uh, just build on the resilience of the of the museum um you know we we've we've, we've long had um, demand and interest for merchandise um bearing particularly lots of our very stocky sheep um and yeah absolute unit t-shirts um arrived on the scene i think uh last winter oh no last autumn um and including lots of merchandise that we produce in partnership with art uk um and our um, our merchandise launch was the most popular launch um, in our UK history. And I think, you know, the fact that we've been able to use our digital engagement, one, as a, as a way of truly kind of creating these museum experiences, but also um, supporting our organisational work and, you know, the helping support our colleagues throughout the, throughout, you know, the last year and beyond has been, has been uh, in, incredible really and, and remains, and remains the case. Thanks, Joe. Um, so I, I wanted to just um, I wanted to just go back to, uh, to thinking about the the virtual reading room and 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 uh, and talk about that because that does actually draw some of the strands together. So as I've said, it's it's essentially it's content behind a registration wall. Um, although most users, uh, even without registering, will be able to see low resolution images. It's so obviously not everything in our collections because not everything is digitized and also not everything um, it, it, we, it has the, um, the, the copyright status uh, that enables us to put it on there. But it is a way of exploring. We developed it pretty quickly and, um, um, and we're, we're pleased with it. Um, it, it works and it certainly relieves, um, it relieves pressure, it's relieved pressure on our inquiry service. It relieves um, uh, pressure on researchers who who you know, literally cannot travel, um, and even now, uh, you know, with international travel being so difficult, it, it gives us some, some options um, that 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 we're comfortable with in terms of in terms of security, etc. Um, but that also um, you know is is relatively easy to use and uh, and to access. So, so that was just a quick snapshot of that. But what I wanted to talk about quickly was just the the next steps of how we're building on it. If we go think, if we think about that circle, uh, that, those circles, you know, all those other things that we were trying to do with digital asset management, um, and the, and there's action happening on on almost all of those. Um, and the one that we're working on at the moment in particular is about um, e-licensing. So you can imagine with such a large um, image collection, uh, most of a lot of which is is photojournalistic uh, images. Um, there, is, uh, there is demand for um, use of those editorially uh, and also on things like um, advertising and merchandising. And that's an important revenue stream for us. But we also want people to be able to use that content in, in a whole range of uh, non-commercial ways as well. So, um, so what we've done is we're extending the virtual reading room to incorporate uh, e-licensing and ordering of prints and, and that type of um, activity, um, which is the project we're working on at the moment. Also in the early stages of looking at, uh, at using essentially the same, uh, the same platform, um, but with slightly different functionality to 
uh, enable some of our digital preservation actions to happen. Um, and this is really just building on the fact that we've got a system that um, that has the necessary connectivity, that has has the necessary um, security clearances, etc., to be able to 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 do that. So rather than from starting from scratch, we're building on the work that we've already done. Um, we, we we have already enabled the virtual reading room to support um, support our. Uh, dedicated terminals um, unfortunately we haven't actually been able, to, been able to put those in physically yet but uh, so dedicated terminals in our reading room which would I think have been our, one of our really big uh, headline digital engagements for 2020 had the pandemic not happened um, uh, will will happen once we get up and running and that that's going to be really uh, really useful for us and then generally we've been doing a lot of work thinking about website integration with our digital asset management system and um, directly and indirectly uh, and some of that involves thinking uh, some, some really interesting thing I think around uh, making the interfaces on our website much more generous in terms of people who don't know what they're looking for being able to to come across interesting particularly visual content that enables them to um to 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 get a view of the museum which is um which is you know not not fully curated um but is also not uh not a catalog system it's a it's, it's an interface that's easy for people to access but has has large quantities of of, of uncurated or semi semi-curated content and then into the into the future um I, I mean i think as our as our digital engagement has sort of increased in intensity um one of the things we did was we moved to a, a moscow model must do should do could do would like to do for um for our digital content um because we realized we needed to improve uh, just just to just just to keep uh, to stop joe from uh, from having uh, <laughs> helping to manage his inbox um we needed a workflow that maintained quality without creating kind of bottlenecks and um, and so the prioritization became very very important and that's now really being extended to our plans to to for improving the website we need a reliable pipeline of, of content um, and we need a reliable pipeline of assets that enables us to to present things to the user and that relates really closely to user journeys um, if I could just jump in very quickly, actually. Yeah, I think one one thing really throughout the pandemic that's been so important, um, as well as our digital engagement with our audience, it's been our digital engagement with ourselves. Um, you know, because there is simply um, in in the way that you know you used to be able to walk around the museum, see things that were going on, you'd hear things in passing. Um, that vanished when everyone started working from home in a way that really I don't think many workplaces in the world were prepared for. Um, so things like um, you know, having having a, a solid um, and and a solid workflow that everyone uh, was buying into in, in a very collaborative sense has been just just an enormous um, factor in, in everything we've been able to do. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Yeah, no, that's a really that's a really interesting point. I think there's a, there's a lot that we've um, that we've learned about how we work with each other as well as with our audiences. And I think one of the things that we've been very keen to develop as well is is to to get our audiences to the point where there's a call to action that might be buying a bit of merchandise or it might be booking for an event it might be planning a visit or it might whatever it is um <clears throat> we want to make sure that that the audiences don't just see content that's not that's not um that's not the point of it that we want them to 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 have the opportunity to do something um to with that um and so for that i think that for those transactions to happen between collections and audiences whether they're simple transactions or whether they're they're more complex longer term transactions um, you know, we need our systems um, that are behind the scenes to be to be ready to th for that, and we need those systems to be able to empower those interactions as well. And so that's been really the focus of what we've been um, we've been trying to do. So um, thank you very much, everybody. Um, if you've got any feedback or questions, those are our, our contact details. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your talk. I'll, I'll start with another question first. So. Um, do you have any advice for smaller institutions looking to make better use of their digital assets? Um, shall, I, shall I take that, Joe? Um, okay. So, so I think it's. I mean, I think, I think it's really interesting. You often look at the larger institutions. We look at <clears throat> we look at people who are bigger than us um, all the time, and I think you you want to use that as your perhaps as your inspiration, but but not not necessarily as your guide, because you know everyone has different budgets, different priorities, different audiences. Um, 
and you 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 want to um you know you need to develop essentially solutions that work for you and that work for you in the long term and that can be built upon um i, I mean one of the things i think that we've tried to do is to is to allow a certain amount of um of, of, of what we might call leapfrogging in terms of how we develop. So, you know, for instance, I, I mentioned that we have several different um, uh, brands or kind of approaches, uh, you know, subject areas really to our collections. Um, but we're trying to make sure that things are on the same platform. So for instance, if we develop something for our, our website, for our WordPress websites, for the Museum of English Rural Life, we, we're trying to make sure that technology, that technological technological development is also applicable to the university art collections, to the to the other university museums, to the special collections. So, so they can then do that. And then maybe they will be the next people to get a project or get a bit of money that enables them to do something that might come through through a different channel. Um, and, and, and that enables us to, uh, but that then benefits back to the mill. So I think this, we, we've been trying to do that, that kind of thing, trying to sort of box clever, I suppose, um, because, uh, and I think small, smaller institutions need to do that. There's, there's no opportunity really to, I mean, even the larger institutions, there's not much opportunity to just throw money at these sorts of things. I think, um, just, just one other very quick thing. I think with, with no matter the size of the organisation, I think it, these things all require like buy-in and participation from like lots more people than than you might think. I think um, that's kind of a misconception in in lots of, um, I think in lots about lots of places that that it all falls um, on maybe one person who's responsible for digital content. I know that's obviously possibly uh, unlikely to even exist in a small institution, but I think. Just having um, you know this focus on digital be a collaborative thing across across an organisation is, is really important. Thank you. Just a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, the Q and A button in Zoom at the bottom there. Um, I'm going to ask um, a question around technology. So, were there any key technologies or standards that were great enablers for you when you were building your solutions? Uh, I think I think one of the things that, uh, about how we work is that you have to you have to keep an eye on the fact that our, our sort of source standards are always um, are, are varied because we've got bibliographic, archival, and uh, museum content coming in. So you automatically got a situation where where you're having to to think about um, about different standards, and you're automatically, I suppose, within our digital asset um system we 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 do um I, we, we do try to pull in collections information i suppose that's a effectively a modified dublin core um if we want to get techie about it um the um but but i think from from that point uh from that point onwards um i think what we were really thinking about much more was actually about compliance i think um that's and that's compliance from 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 the point of view of accessibility but also compliance from the point of view of uh of of copyright um i think that that's and in fact that's actually probably been the, the, the one of the big lessons from this is that you set out on what you think is uh, essentially that the virtual reading room project for instance you set out on something which you think is a te technical project um actually technologically it was pretty pretty simple um the, the developers may not agree with me on that but it was yeah it wasn't it wasn't doing anything particularly outrageous on that but um i spent um you know weeks and weeks just just going back and forth with the copyright advisors and i think that's one of the things that i think is 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 interesting but i think the other thing that's been really interesting is we didn't know what the standards were people weren't doing you know for instance we 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 had we we thought at first that we needed to develop certain things to support university teaching we then um, got into a situation where we thought perhaps we didn't, but then it came back uh, and, and it became very, the virtual reading room has been really useful in supporting um, uh, university teaching, but in a way that perhaps we hadn't quite expected. So I think, you know, we, we didn't know what the standards were because we didn't quite know what the demand was um, in March, April, May, 2020. But I don't know if you wanted to add anything, Joe, about, about that as well. Um, I mean, I suppose on the subject of copyright, the fact that we have, um, really clearly within our digital asset management system, um, labels for images that are copyright uh, free or, or that we're able to use is, is hugely helpful in, in you know, the kind of delivery and creation of content because there isn't that kind of uh, middle stage you know, when we're looking to create things on social media or on the website where we're thinking, is this image okay for us to use? Because um, part of the archiving um, process or the kind of digitization is marking whether it's, it's fine or not, um, which yeah, it's, it's kind of, 
not quite technology, but but a huge step in terms of um, the infrastructure we have. Thanks. And a couple of questions just came in around infrastructure and and dams. And could you just talk a little bit more about um, dams? Um, we were conscious of time, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So our, our, our dams is uh, is in uh, using an off the shelf solution called Asset Bank, um, used by a lot of public authorities. Um, we're actually hosting it on our own um, IT's infrastructure rather than the hosted solution. Um, and then the virtual reading room is using uh, Apexio by by Metadatis, which is a, essentially a kind of a, a, a catalog discovery um, front end to it. Um, and that's just uh, taking a, a feed of the, the of the assets, not all the assets, but some of the assets um, via via an API. Um, uh, so so effectively, what it's doing. I mean, our first and, and just to say, thinking about how we approach things, our first thing was to say, can we make asset bank work as a public front end and the answer to that in the end was no it, it didn't have enough to be able to do that that job it works very well internally but it doesn't work for the public audience that we need in the way that we needed it to work